In the early hours of 2nd July 1949, a 22-year-old Indian student sitting inside Harvard University's observatory made the discovery of a lifetime. While analyzing photographs of the night sky taken with the telescope, he suddenly noticed a strange white dot on one of them. A faint streak in the sky where there should be nothing. He spent the next few hours doing calculations, making sure he hadn't made a mistake, but he hadn't. He had just discovered a new comet, a very special one, a comet that visits Earth only once in 60,000 years. The last time it visited us, we were still in the Ice Age, and the next time it comes around, we might not even be the same species. Within days, this young student became world famous. The comet was named after him, he won a prestigious medal, and Harvard celebrated. But then, something insane happened. While the world was busy congratulating him, his own country's government sent him a letter telling him to stop wasting time chasing comets and threatened to ruin his career if he continued to do so. Today, I want to tell you the story of why that happened and how this young man grew up to become one of the most famous astronomers of all time, and how he gave up international fame and recognition to come back home and change the system that tried to destroy him. This is the story of Manali Kalat Venubapu, the father of modern Indian astronomy. My name is Tirthak Saha, and you are watching Under the Radar. A big shout out to the Zero One Network for making this series possible. In the early 1900s, while India was being torn apart by the British, an Indian man in Chennai was busy studying the stars. He worked at the Nizamiya Observatory in Hyderabad and every night he went to work, he looked up at the stars and he wished for a better future for his country. And on August 10th, 1927, his wish was granted and a baby boy was born to him. This boy was named Manali Kalat Venu Bappu and his future was kind of already written in the stars from the very start. He would later say that he learned astronomy in his father's lab. And from an early age, Bappu was a true genius. By the time he was just 19, he had already built a spectrometer in his house and used its findings to publish two papers that got the attention of the international astronomical community. Wait, wait, wait. Let's rewind that a little bit because I want to make sure that this is very clear. A spectrometer is a complex scientific instrument that splits light into its component wavelengths. Observatories and universities around the world spend thousands of dollars on these things. And this 19-year-old kid built one by himself in his house with no formal training, 19 year old. This is who we are talking about. But as brilliant as he was, he faced an obstacle. An obstacle faced by every brilliant Indian mind of that time. You see, there were no advanced astronomy programs in India. Zero. If you wanted to study the stars or space professionally, you had to leave the country. But with Bappu's limited financial resources, this was only a dream. Until a random meeting in Hyderabad turned this dream into reality. In 1948, Harlow Shapley visited Hyderabad. Let me explain who Shapley was. This is the man who had literally calculated the size of our galaxy. He was also the guy who had proved that we and our sun weren't at the center of the Milky Way. Two of the most incredible astronomical discoveries of the 20th century. But more importantly for our story, he was also the director of Harvard University's observatory. In astronomy circles, meeting him was like meeting Sachin Tendulkar. And guess who ran into him in Hyderabad? A young Venu Bappu. When Shapley met this young kid who had already published two papers and built his own instruments, he was stunned. And very quickly, he offered him a spot in his PhD program back at Harvard. He even wrote a letter of recommendation that helped Bappu get a scholarship from the government of Hyderabad. And so, in 1949, Bappu's dreams became a reality and he set sail for America. But what happened next would lead to a nasty public international fight between Harvard University and the Indian government. The 1940s and 50s saw a huge wave of advancements in the field of astronomy. And of men building and using the great 200-inch telescope at Palomar Mountain, probably the most precise and significant engineering achievement of all time. Major observatories and powerful telescopes were built around the world and astronomers started mapping out our universe. 
For large telescopes with their great magnification and light gathering power are used almost entirely as cameras to photograph the wonders of the heavens. But because this was before we had super powerful computers, the mapping and processing of all this data had to be done manually by humans. And this was seriously boring work. Night after night, you look for tiny variations in thousands of dots of light on photographic plates and most nights you found nothing. And that's why professors would have students running night shifts to go through this mountain of data and photographs and make sure that they hadn't missed anything, that everything was mapped correctly. But what was boring work for others was Bappu's wildest dream dreams come true. And so, even though his PhD program did not ask him to, he volunteered for night duty at the Harvard Observatory. And that is how on that fateful night of July 2nd, 1949, while he was on night duty, Bappu noticed a strange white streak on one of the photographic plates that he was analyzing. After rechecking his own calculations, he called his professor Bart Bock and fellow student Gordon Newkirk. They also checked, checked again, calculated the object's trajectory, but there was no mistake in Bappu's calculations. Bappu had just discovered a new comet, one that had never been seen before in human history. Six days later, the International Astronomical Union made it official. This comet would be called Bappu Bok Newkirk. At just 22 years old, he became the first and only Indian to have a comet named after him. And while all of this was going on, that is when he got this letter from the Indian government a letter that threatened his future as an astronomer. The letter was sent by some officials at the Indian Embassy in Washington, D.C. And if you read it, at first it seems harmless. My dear Bapu, the Hyderabadi government has cabled to say that you should only undertake research on photoelectric photometry of eclipsing variables. Please note this carefully and see that your government's wishes are carried out in every respect. But you can tell, right, that the hidden warning was very clear. The government has given you a scholarship to only complete your PhD on this one topic and nothing else. If we find you wasting time on unnecessary things like chasing comets, we will cancel your scholarship. Pause for a second, forget the letter. Think about the timing of this. India has only been independent for two years. This a new country is looking to build a modern scientific reputation. Today, the people of India, having won their independence, are looking forward with hope to a better life. And here's an Indian scientist making international headlines and your response to him is, stop wasting time and focus on your syllabus? I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but this mindset plagues the Indian education system even today. They just don't understand that education doesn't work like that. It's not linear. The best education happens when you let students go out and explore different things and combine them in new ways to make discoveries. <sighs> anyway. Back to the story. When he read the letter, Bappu was naturally scared. Without funding, he'd have to leave Harvard. His career would be over before it even started. And that is when another superstar entered the chat, Fred Lawrence Whipple. This man was a legend in the scientific community. He had discovered one of the most important astronomical theories of the 20th century. When Fred Lawrence Whipple spoke, the scientific world listened. And Whipple was angry very angry. He wrote a letter back to the Indian officials and this is what it said. I am informed by Mr. Bapu that he has been reprimanded by the Hyderabadi government. This is the first occasion in my experience in which a foreign government has criticized our educational methods in the astronomy department of Harvard University. Translation, how dare you tell us how to train our astronomers? He continued, I feel that if the Hyderabadi government feels Mr. Bapu's training is inadequate, they should write to the Harvard authorities and not threaten the student. In fact, he also added a sentence referencing what I was talking about earlier. Our experience has shown that independence of mind and freedom in choosing research problems are essential to a physical scientist who is to produce creative work. And after Whipple's letter, the entire Harvard astronomy department started defending Bappu. The message was clear, you're attacking one of our own and we will not let it happen. Facing a public backlash from one of the world's most renowned universities, the Indian officials backed down and the scholarship continued. But put yourself in this situation, you're 22 years old, you've made a discovery that scientists dream about and your own government tells you to stop? 
Others would have been broken, but Bappu used this as motivation. And in that moment, he promised himself that he would come back home and change this system. Now, most scientists make only one life-changing discovery in their careers, but Bappu wasn't most scientists. He was only getting started. After completing his PhD, Bappu, along with an American astronomer named Wilson, discovered a way to use a star's brightness to figure out how far away it is and how much surface gravity it has. This came to be called the Wilson-Bappu effect. And in the world of astronomy, this is as famous as E equals mc square. You'll find it in astronomy textbooks worldwide. And after that, Bappu became an international superstar. He started getting job offers from everywhere. European observatories, American universities, even Harvard wanted to keep him permanently. But he remembered the promise he made to himself and rejected all of them. In 1953, Bappu returned to India. A country with no modern observatories, no advanced telescopes and no astronomy programs. And Bappu's response? Fine. I'll build it all myself. First, he gave new life to the old Uttar Pradesh State Observatory by relocating it away from the city pollution in Varanasi to the clear skies of Nainital up in the Himalayan foothills. Then, he modernized the historic Kodai Kanal Observatory, fitting it with the latest equipment. But his masterpiece was yet to come. You see, Bappu wanted to build a new observatory from scratch, not one of India's old buildings, something modern that could be fitted with a large advanced telescope, something that could compete internationally nationally. And to build this, he selected a remote village in Tamil Nadu called Kavalur. No roads, no electricity, just miles and miles of forest. And people called him crazy. You want to build a world-class observatory in the middle of nowhere in a developing country with limited funds? But none of that stopped him. And he didn't just design the observatory. He literally helped build it. He was living on site during construction and even helped lay the bricks. And when European suppliers would charge too much for the advanced components, Bappu said, fine, we will build it here. And he started teaching Indian engineers how to build advanced telescope components that the Europeans said could never be built in a country like India. This observatory and telescope would later be known as the Venu Bappu Observatory and the Venu Bappu Telescope. And it would become Asia's largest observatory and India's largest telescope at the time. And they put Indian astronomy on the global map. Here's a few things they discovered. Discovered an atmosphere around Jupiter's moon Ganymede, confirmed that Uranus has rings, and found a thin outer ring around Saturn. And as if all of this wasn't enough, in 1979, Bappu achieved what no other Indian had before or since. He was elected the president of the International Astronomical Union, the body that governs astronomy internationally. The boy who was punished for discovering a comet was now the leader of astronomy everywhere. In August 1982, Venu Bappu was traveling to Greece to address the International Astronomical Union as its president. His dream was to convince them to host their next assembly in India so that he could show them how far Indian astronomy had come. But sadly, during a layover in Munich, he suffered a massive heart attack and passed away. He was just 55 years old. He never got to deliver his presidential address, never saw his telescope and observatory fully operational, never knew that three years later the IAU would actually honor his wish and host the next assembly in New Delhi, India. M.K. Venubapu never tasted the fruits of his own labor. If this man was born in the West, he would be as famous as a Stephen Hawking. But sadly, he was born here where we Indians ourselves don't tell his story. The comet named after him won't return to Earth for another 59,500 years, but Bappu's real legacy returns every single night. In every discovery made from the observatories he built, in every student that studies astronomy in India, in every ISRO mission that we take pride in, they all benefit from Venu Bappu's legacy. All because one night in 1949, a young man looked up at the stars and saw something moving and refused to look away, even when his own government told him to. <laughs>